Hello and welcome to this video in the IBM Cloud Foundation Skill Series. This is going to be a lecture and we're going to be focusing on explaining the different flavours of virtual server that are available in the IBM Cloud. So the IBM Cloud currently has four different flavours of virtual server and they are public, dedicated, transient and reserved. And when you choose virtual servers in the catalogue, you'll see these options. So it's important that you understand what each one is and which one might be best for your use case. Before we learn a bit more about the different flavours though, these are some of the things that they have in common. They are all available from our locations around the globe, and that's currently over 45, which means applications can have a truly global footprint. You can size your servers to meet your workload, starting from one vCPU and one gigabyte of RAM, right up to 64 vCPUs and 512 gigabytes of RAM. You can provision a network performance of up to one gigabit per second on the public and private networks. To explain these networks a little more, the public network is the network on which you typically route traffic over the internet, while the private network is an internal network uh, which you can use to link up your servers. Now the great thing with IBM Cloud is that there's no charge to move data around on the private network, so you can send data from a server in London to one in Sydney, Sydney quickly over the private network, and unlike most other cloud vendors, IBM won't charge you a penny. And on all virtual servers you can mount up to five SAN volumes, that's one boot disk plus four other mounted volumes. Now the boot disk can either be 25 gigabytes or 100 gigabytes in size, so 25 gigabytes is free of charge. And for additional volumes, you can choose a minimum of uh, 100, and, uh, sorry, a minimum of 10 gigabytes, right up to two terabytes. Now on the dedicated flavor of a uh, virtual server, you can choose local disks over SAM. Uh, if you choose local disks, then you can have a 25, 100, or 150 gigabyte boot disk, and you can then have uh, additional local disks between 25 gigabytes and 400 gigabytes in size. All right, so what do the different flavors look like? Well, a public virtual server is, I suppose, the default offering. It's the one that we've had the longest. If you create one, then it sits on a shared hardware base or a multi-tenant hardware base, meaning that other customers will also have virtual machines on the same physical server, although, of course, they'll all be securely separated. It's worth noting that IBM don't over-provision the hardware either. So some cloud providers do over-provision, which means that if a customer starts to really work their server hard, it can take resources from another, a situation which is called having noisy neighbours, but you never suffer that in IBM Cloud. These servers can be rapidly provisioned, and they're also rapidly scalable, so you can quickly change their CPU or RAM settings if you need to after they've been created. There is a system downtime, but you can choose when the, when the actual change in the def or the downtime takes place. Billing for public virtual servers is either hourly or monthly, and the decision here is going to be based on how long you're likely to need the server for. A dedicated virtual server sits on hardware which is dedicated, so underneath it's a single tenant host server that one single customer is using, and typically the reason that you'd want to do this is where you have certain compliance or security considerations, where for instance you need to run workloads on hosts that are not shared or where you have local disks, which again isn't shared, or where performance is of paramount concern. When provisioning dedicated virtual servers, you need to have a host on which to put it. So if it's your first dedicated virtual server, the first step is to provision a physical host, and you can choose the data center location down to the pod level where you want this to be. And this is good for resilience because you may want two hosts in the same data center, but for resilience you can locate them in different pods and of course each pod will have different power supplies and so on. All hosts have 56 CPU cores, 242 gigabytes of RAM and 1.2 terabytes of disk and you pay hourly or monthly for the host. Once you have the host you can then provision virtual machines onto the host. If you pay monthly for the host then you can choose to pay monthly or hourly for the guest VMs and those payments are obviously for the use of the services which are outside the physical host so you don't pay again for the CPU or RAM but you would pay for things like SAM and networking. Now transient virtual servers are also hosted on shared or multi-tenant hosts, but they are a really cheap option. So why are they so cheap? Well basically, IBM runs their data centers so that there is enough spare capacity for additional demand and spikes in demand. And you can think of this as a kind of a buffer. When this buffer isn't being used, it's capacity that's otherwise going spare. So IBM offers this to customers for transient virtual servers. Now, the thing to note with transient virtual servers is that if IBM needs that spare capacity uh, back again, they will automatically deprovision transient virtual servers until there is enough buffer capacity. 
This is done on a first provision, first deprovision basis. This means, of course, that if you have a workload that must be on and running, then putting it on a transient virtual server would be a bit of a mistake because it could disappear at any time. But if you have workloads that can run whenever there is capacity available, these are fantastic because of the low, low cost. Lastly, we have the reserve virtual server. Again, this resides on a multi-tenant host, but there are deep discounts available over standard public virtual servers because you're reserving capacity for up to one or three years and making a long-term commitment. So if you have workloads or need capacity which fits into these timeframes, for example, you might be hosting enterprise applications, this is a far cheaper way to provision those virtual servers. Looking a bit closer at how that works, the first step is that you reserve a capacity block, and this is a chunk of CPU and RAM. The way that you work out the size of the reserved capacity block is to determine the size of the virtual servers that you want to create, and multiply that by the number of virtual servers that you need, up to 20 virtual servers. So at the moment, each virtual server that you provision in the reserved capacity will have the same CPU and RAM configuration, though this may change in the future. But you can create multiple reserved capacity blocks, each size for the different types of server that you have. So you choose the location of your reserved capacity and the term, which is one or three years, and you pay for this reserved capacity monthly. You then choose whether to pay for the VMs hourly or monthly, and this refers to the costs for the storage, operating systems and so on, so costs which are not CPU or RAM. And that's it for this lecture. Remember that there are four different types of virtual server, public, dedicated, transient and reserved, each of which has different price points and use cases. So when selecting your virtual server, bear in mind these different options and match up to your workload. Thanks for watching and next up we'll have a lab on creating a VM.